Hello, I'm going to present uh, our paper Practical Product Proofs for Lattice Commitments. And this is joint work with Thomas Atema and Vadim Yubashevsky, and my name is Gregor Seiler. Okay, so let me start with, with a simple example that shows that product proofs are useful. And this example is about range proofs. In a range proof, the goal is to be able to commit to some vector and then prove that uh, the vector is binary, so all the coefficients are either 0 or 1, and also that the integer that is encoded by the vector lies in a certain interval, which means that only the first k coefficients are, are really 0 or 1, and then the remaining n minus k coefficients are all 0, which uh, implies that the integer that is encoded lies in the interval between 0 and 2 to the k. And then, therefore, this is called a range proof. Um, this problem can be solved with a product proof where one is able to prove product relations on individual coefficients of the vector m. So precisely we want to be able to prove that the first k coefficients are 0, 1. So we prove that they fulfill the um, relations mi times 1 minus mi equals 0. And then we want to prove that the, the other coefficients are 0, which we show by proving the relation mi squared equals 0. Now in our paper, um, one of the main results is an improved product proof for a certain lattice-based commitment scheme. And then in turn, this product proof allows to construct a range proof, um, which for a 1024-bit range has a proof size of 31 kilobytes. But apart from this result, we also uh, give uh, new technical uh, contributions that are interesting outside of uh, product or range proofs. Okay, with this introduction, let me start uh, with the algebraic setup that we will be using. Um, and as is usually the case in efficient lattice-based constructions, we will be working over some polynomial ring. Now it has emerged in the uh, last years that it's usually best to choose the smallest ring that is sufficient for a task and therefore in all our protocols we will use uh, this standard uh, power of two cyclotomic ring of rank 128. The rank 128 is because we aim for 128 bits of security and then uh, the, the, the modulus uh, we are using will be a prime number but I'm saying more about this in a second. So the modulus Q. Okay so uh, I said our product proof is proving product relations for a particular lattice-based commitment scheme. So let me introduce uh, this commitment scheme now. Um, we will be using the, the BDLOP commitment scheme. This was uh, presented at SCN 2018. In this scheme, there are the following public parameters. Uh, there's a matrix B0 over the ring RQ, and then there are potentially many row vectors B1, B2, and so on. Uh, with this public information, one can commit to arbitrary polynomials in, in the ring RQ, let's call them M1, M2, and so on, by sampling a short vector R and computing the following expressions. So one computes B0 times R, and then for every message polynomial MI, BIR plus MI. Um, and then all these uh, polynomials Ti together with the vector T0, this uh, uh, gives the full commitment to, to all the polynomials mi. This is really a proper commitment scheme, so it is hiding and binding, and it's very easy to see this, so I'm quickly recalling the, this fact. Um, the scheme is hiding because every polynomial in T0, but also the, the polynomials Ti, they contain an additive term that is uh, an independent module LWE sample, therefore all the polynomials look uniformly random under the module LWE assumption. And um, the scheme is binding because if one would be able to choose uh, uh, to change one of the messages mi without change, changing the corresponding commitment ti, then one would also need to be able to change uh, the randomness vector r. But this first equation t0 equals b0r kind of serves to authenticate this vector r. So uh, if one would be able to give a second vector that still gives the same t0, second randomness vector, then one would have found a module cis solution, which we assume is not possible. 
Okay, so now essentially all the efficient zero knowledge proofs about this commitment scheme, they have an underlying building block that is um, just in a so called approximate proof for the first equation. And we call this building block the opening proof because this uh, proof of the first equation in, on its own essentially shows that one knows an opening for the commitment. And then starting from this building blocks, usually zero knowledge proof systems about this commitment scheme work by adding additional features to this opening proof. Um, so basically extending this opening proof and our product proof is no, no example. But since we also give a new analysis of this opening proof that is very crucial for our product proof, I will now start with uh, the opening proof. Um, as I said, it's an approximate proof of the first equation which is essentially modeled after Schnorr proofs in the discrete block world. And it works in the following way. Um, the prover samples a short so-called masking vector y from some narrow distribution, uh, then computes w, which is b0y, sends this to the verifier. The verifier samples a challenge c, which is a very short polynomial that usually consists of uh, trinary coefficients in minus 1, 0, 1. Uh, then the verifier sends this polynomial to the prover who computes what we call a masked opening. And we call this mask opening Z and it is of the following form. It is uh, the masking vector Y plus C times uh, the, the randomness vector. And then in, in the lattice world, uh, there is a, a technical complication. Uh, the prover cannot just send this Z, otherwise uh, the protocol would not be zero knowledge because the Z would reveal sec uh, secret information. But there's um, by now a standard technique um, how to avoid this by basically aborting if, if uh, that uh, reveals secret information. If the prover is, is uh, able to send uh, the, the Z, then the verifier checks uh, that it is short and some verification equation. So this is uh, the approximate proof for the first equation which shows that one knows an opening. Now I give an example how this can be extended to prove additional statements. And the, the simplest extension, for example, is if the prover just wanted to prove that one of the message polynomials, say m1, is zero. In this case, the prover would also compute b1y and send this to the verifier, who then checks an additional verification equations. So this is essentially a general pattern that one uses this building block and adds new polynomials that are sent and new verification equations for the verifier and then one gets uh, uh, basically more advanced protocols. If one then anal uh, uh, analyzes um, this uh, proof of commitment to zero that I've presented on the previous slide, uh, then one finds that all one can extract is, is the following. So the uh, thing one can extract is one message m1 and a so-called challenge difference c bar that is uh, the, the difference of two challenges in two accepting transcripts, such that c bar times m1 equals zero. Now this is of course only sufficient to prove that m1 is zero if c bar is invertible. And for this uh, technical reasons, all um, previous papers about uh, zero knowledge proofs uh, for the BDLOP commitment scheme, they have uh, restricted to the case where c bar is always known to be invertible. So this is possible by either choosing the ring in a, in a suitable way or by restricting the challenge set so that one knows that the difference of all uh, challenge polynomials is always invertible. And uh, with this uh, I uh, can explain that our first um, basically improvement for the opening proof is that we drop this assumption that c bar is invertible and show how to work with non-invertible challenges. Um, I explain this in the following way. So we need first a better characterization what it means for an element in our ring to be invertible. And the best characterization for this works via the Chinese remainder theorem. So uh, essentially depending on how much Q splits in the cyclotomic ring, um, our ring RQ is the product of uh, smaller fields. So this is nothing else than that uh, the, the polynomial x to the 128 plus 1 factors modulo q into smaller polynomials and then by the Chinese remainder theorem uh, this 
this ring is a product of, of the rings CQX modulo these, these uh, factor polynomials. Um, for, for simplicity, we usually call uh, the, the, the fields uh, that emerge the, the CRT slots, CRT for Chinese remainder theorem. Um, now for the talk, I um, decided to focus on a particular simple case uh, for our protocol where the ring only splits into CRT slots of degree 4. Uh, so this is why um, basically all the factors of x to the 128 plus 1 are of the form x to the 4 minus r. Uh, this removes a lot of the complications in our paper, but it simplifies the, the, the talk. Okay, so um, now uh, we, with this uh, basically splitting of our ring, uh, we see that uh, some element, uh, for example c bar, is invertible if and only if it is non-zero uh, modulo all the, all the factors x to the 4 minus rj. And if you remember this equation uh, c bar times m1 equals 0, then we see uh, this is not used uh, less in the case where c bar is, is uh, non-invertible, because it still proves that m1 is 0 modulo all the x to the 4 minus rj, where c is really non-zero. It's just that there might be a couple of entity slots where z by is zero, and then in these entity slots we don't learn anything about M1. Therefore, and, and the, the idea for our um, improved protocol is that we don't try to be able in the extraction to get a challenge different C bar that is really invertible, so non-zero everywhere, but we uh, want to set up uh, the scheme in such a way that the extractor can obtain many different uh, C bar J's with the property that for every, uh, uh, basically for every factor x to the 4 minus rj, there is one C bar J that is non-zero there. And then if we also have all these equations C bar J uh, times m1 uh, equals zero, then we can piece them all together and deduce that m1 is really completely zero everywhere. Okay, so how do we implement this idea? Um, essentially, all we have to do is we have to bound the probability that C bar is zero modulo um, these factors x to the 4 minus r. Because if this probability is, is very small, then intu intuitively the prover um, has a small cheating probability. Um, so basically all the prover can do uh, to, to get away with proving that m1 is uh, 0 if, if it is not 0 modulo 1 of the x to the 4 minus r is to hope that um, c bar is always 0 um, uh, modulo this factor and if this probability is really small then, then his success probability is small. So yeah, the, the, yeah. So how do we compute this probability? Uh, if, if we write down a challenge polynomial c with coefficients ci that are sampled from the set minus 1, 0, 1. Then we can slightly rewrite this polynomial by grouping together coefficients uh, whose index is or has the same remainder mod 4. Um, so I've done this uh, on the bottom of, of the slide and in this representation of c we see that uh, the reduction of c mod x to the 4 minus r, this is a polynomial with four coefficients and all the all the coefficients are evaluations of completely independent polynomials at r. So therefore the, the coefficients of c mod x to the 4 minus r are independent and in, in the paper we compute um, the distribution, or not really the full distribution, but the maximum probability of this distribution over uh, zq and find that for suitable parameters uh, this maximum probability is not much larger than 1 over q. Um, and then, uh, basically, following from this, we can deduce that the probability that c bar mod x to the 4 minus r is 0, which uh, means that all the four coefficients are 0. This happens only with probability essentially q to the minus 4. And if q is in the order of 2 to the 32, then this q to the minus 4 is negligibly small, so around 2 to the minus 128. Uh, of course, um, modulo other factors, so I've, I've uh, focused on, on, on this first factor on this slide, but all the, the probability or the maximum probability modulo the other factors is not independent, but
but this is also not needed because we are not trying to get a C bar which is non-zero everywhere and this is enough that basically for each factor x to the 4 minus rj this uh, cheating probability is small individually because then the, the extractor by, by basically successively rebinding can, can get a C bar modulo all the factors where, where it is not zero. Okay, so this concludes our first improvement of the opening proof. Now I come to the second improvement that is um, directly applied in our product proof. The second improvement is that we are able to show that the reply Z, so this mask opening sent by the prover in the opening proof, uh, this is at least uh, when the prover has sufficiently high success probability, this is always uh, precisely of the form in uh, the honest transcript or in the honest execution. Um, so by this I mean uh, that the, the, in, in the extraction we are able to extract vectors y and r such that z can be written as y plus cr. And these yr are fixed in the sense that if we rewind the prover and send a new c, then we of course get a new reply z, but it will still be of the form y plus cr with the, si with the same y and r as before. So the prover really is committed to, to y and r. And it's not only this, but the, these vectors y, r fulfill the equations that we ex expect. This in particular means uh, that, uh, that the r vector is a useful, uh, is, is a valid a randomness vector for the commitment scheme, which means that the commitment polynomials Ti, they can be written as Bir plus Mi. Um, I should note that it is not necessarily true that Y and R are short anymore, but um, this is also not needed here. Okay, this um, basically new analysis of the opening proof uh, makes it now uh, much easier to work with more complicated verification equations that we knew how to handle before, um, and as, uh, in particular verification equations that are non-linear in, in the commitments. And uh, basically the, the, the first example for this is our product proof, which works in the following way now. Um, so as I said before, we know that uh, the, the mask openings Z can be written as Y plus CR with uh, fixed uh, y and r that are independent of c and t1 is b1 r plus m1 and this allows us to do the following so we can let the verifier compute uh, the polynomial f which uh, is, is defined by b1 z minus ct1 and if you look at this expression and just uh, substitute the two equations from above then we find that f can be written as b1 y minus c m1 if you now look at this last equation, then we see that this is really just a mask opening of M1, where the masking polynomial is B1Y and uh, the, 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 the secret is, is, is the message M1. And yeah, so this is something which in previous uh, product proofs would have been sent by the, by the prover. So in previous product proofs, the prover would have sent a mask opening of M1 and now we see that we can let the verifier compute this from data he has received in the opening proof without uh, further communication cost. And in previous protocols where the prover has sent such a mask opening, it was also necessary that the prover um, proved that F is really well formed, so it's really a uh, correct mask opening of M1. And in our case, this is not necessary anymore because the verifier um, uh, computed f in a controlled way and therefore is convinced that, that f, is, f is correctly formed. And these two facts together decrease uh, the, the communication cost of our product group. Um, and then after we have established that the verifier can get hold of a mask opening, uh, the, the protocol proceeds in the standard way. So uh, the, we construct the following quadratic equation in f, which is f squared minus cf. And if we evaluate this um, and uh, group together coefficients uh, that involve the same power of c, so that we get a quadratic polynomial in c, then we get a constant in linear term that are not important, which we call the garbage terms, and a leading term, so the quadratic term, which uh, uh, involves uh, the coefficient m1 squared minus m1. And then also in the standard way, if one proves uh, that uh, this leading coefficient vanishes, 
then this proves the relation uh, we want to prove. And this works by essentially committing to the garbage terms, subtracting them, and then proving that the resulting polynomial is the zero polynomial. Now, um, I said before that in the talk I focus on the case where our ring splits into CRT slots of, of degree 4. Um, and in this case, uh, the proof I've just um, basically um, explained on a high level, this proof already has negligible soundness error, because the soundness error of this approach is essentially determined by the size of the CRT slots. In, in many applications, it is uh, advantages to, to, to let the ring further split, so in, uh, for example, fully split in, in, into linear factors. And then uh, this approach would only have uh, the soundness uh, basically one over Q, which is non negligible. Um, so then in this case, uh, the, the question arises how can one boost the soundness, and is there maybe a better way than just repeating the protocol several times? And this is another technical uh, um, um, basically contribution of our paper, which can also be used in, in other protocols, not just in our product proof. But since it is quite technical, I'm not going into much detail here. I'm just giving a very high-level idea how this works. Um, the idea is essentially that we set up the opening proof in such a way that the prover is uh, the verifier is not just able to compute one mask opening of the message M1, but several mask openings where the the, the message is rotated under some automorphism sigma. And this is also very important, all the mask openings still involve the same non-rotated challenge C. And as soon as we have this, um, that we can basically construct the same uh, quadratic relations um, on F as before, but now for several F, and then linear combine all of them with uh, uniformly random challenge polynomials alpha. And if we do this, then we arrive at a still quadratic polynomial just in C, but with a leading term that is a random linear combination of the rotations of m1 squared minus m1. And uh, then by doing the same as before, proving that uh, this term vanishes, we actually prove the relation with negligible soundness error. Um, the advantage of this approach over just repeating uh, the, 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 the basic protocol several times is that we still only have a quadratic polynomial in C in the end, and which means that there's still only two garbage terms. Um, so basically, the, 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 whereas when we, when we would have repeated the, poly, the product several times, then we would have two garbage terms per repetition, which, costs, which in, in, involves costs in the form of commitments to these garbage terms. Okay, with this, I finish my presentation and uh, thank you very much for listening.